Hello, BookTube. I have a Friday Reads for you. I almost forgot about one of BookTube's most venerable traditions, Friday Reads. Uh, I've got six books to show you, and uh, three of them I've already read, and three of them I have not. So we'll start with the three that I have not read, and the first of the three that I have not read is also one that I'd very much kind of like not to read. <laughs> but I'm I'm kind of committed. <laughs> I, I, uh... <sighs> I'm kind of committed to ruining an hour and a half of my life with this book. This is Siege uh, by Michael Wolf, the author of the best-selling book, uh, Fire and Fury. It was a monstrous bestseller in every meaning of that word. <laughs> and, I, and I reviewed it for The National. If I remember, I'll, uh, I'll leave a link down below. Uh, and this is his follow-up. And I'm... I'm I'm going to read it because I'm committed. This is probably going to sell not quite as much as Fire and Fury, but uh, but quite a bit. Fire and Fury was was sort of the first volley of people who aren't David K. Johnson to say what a what an absolute uh, clown car trash fire disaster this whole administration is and this whole guy is. Uh, this aside from people who've been writing and commenting on Trump for decades, <laughs> your your humble servant included. Uh, Fire and Fury was really the first thing, that, the first book that came along that told the general public something like the true story. Uh, Michael Wolff was given unimpeded access. He was he was in the Oval Office. He was in meetings, just quietly taking notes. The, the, and uh, it was like one commentator said, uh, "If if you're talking." with your aides in the Oval Office, and Michael Wolff is at the other end of the couch and he's very happy, you have a major problem. <laughs> but they didn't seem to realize it. Uh, and Fire and Fury was full of scandalous revelations, most of which were then confirmed by sober journalists, uh, including Bob Woodward uh, in his book Fear. Uh, and all of it, it was old news to those of us who've been writing against Trump for decades. This guy is an absolute monster. The worst stuff about him is not public knowledge, yet, common public knowledge yet. And, and I'm sure that it won't be in this book either. I read the first chapter of this book just to get a sense of whether or not it was going to be any more, any soberer or more bearable than, than Fire and Fury. It is not. <laughs> and unless it changes drastically after the first chapter, it's not. And the first chapter, Wolf says that, that he, he talked to a whole bunch of Trump insiders. Now that part, I believe, people in the Trump administration at all levels are probably still talking to this guy because it's an extremely leaky organization. And every single person who leaks to someone like Michael Wolff or anybody else, the New York Times, is a traitor. Because they're, they're getting off on the titillation instead of doing something to stop this administration. They're going along with the work in order to get the lulls. And that makes them a traitor. That, that means they have put uh, personal profit above the well-being of their country. <sighs> uh, but I'm going to read this, <laughs> and I'm probably going to write about it as well. And we will just see. I mean, th th that the, the contract with Fire and Fury was that Michael Wolff had access to the Trump administration. He most certainly does not anymore. He has those people who are willing to talk off the record, but you know, the the good thing there is that you get all the hot gossip, and the bad thing, unlike being given access to the players actually in on the scene, is that you can't verify any of it. It's all gossip. It, it shouldn't be reported, even if a lot of it is true. The, a lot of the people that he talks to in the chapter that I read said there, there was a refrain that came up over and over again, which is that people saying, independent of each other and without knowing what each other is saying, I have never met anyone as mentally unbalanced as this guy, as Donald Trump. I've never met anyone who's as crazy as he is, it, it, even in a single conversation. It's not just that he never remembers anything, and it's not just that he lies and knows that he's lying, just says something that comes into his head and expects you to nod because your job depends on him. Only he's crazy enough to think that that applies to everyone in the world. That if he says something that is demonstrably, visibly not true, to in a room full of you know foreign diplomats or whatever, they have to agree with him because otherwise he'll fire them. The idea that he can't fire them just isn't conceivable to him. <laughs> uh, but it, it, even in this first chapter, you have to wonder. Yes, he's talking to all these people behind the scenes, 
But his only his only real sources are gossip. He doesn't have any direct sources anymore. So I don't know. This might end up being more frustrating than Fire and Fury. We shall see. We shall see. I will suffer it, so you don't have to. <laughs> then this next one, I have high hopes. This is also a June book. This is Symphony in C uh, by Robert Hezen. And this is, he's a popular science writer, and this is all about carbon. Uh, carbon is in the news, right? Uh, carbon emissions, the world's carbon emissions are in the news. That's at the heart of the radical climate change debate, if there is one. Uh, certainly the public football back and forth of climate change. It's all about carbon, your carbon footprint. That has become part of the, of the lexicon. Uh, and this is all about carbon just in general, where, how ubiquitous it is, how many forms it takes, where it originated, what happens to it, <laughs> or what might happen to it. Uh, I can't wait. I just can't wait. I'm, uh, I love books like this anyway. I will be entirely relying on the author to do a great job in dumbing it down for someone like me. Uh, but we shall see. That's not the only science book on this list. So, But it, uh, it's the only science book in the first three, which are the books that I have not read yet. So... I've got the Michael Wolf, I've got Symphony in C, and then to round things off, I've got a romance novel. This is The Summer of Sunshine and Margot by Susan Mallory, uh, who Sarah at Steeped in Books, uh, my my booktube soul animal, refers to Susan Mallory as a member of what she calls the Holy Trinity, three great contemporary romance writers who are very much of a, of a, a similarity and who do great lively jobs. And I have never read a Susan Mallory novel that I didn't like. And this one, this one has a classic Susan Mallory setup. Uh, etiquette coach Margot Baxter knows precisely how to manage wayward clients until she comes face to exquisite face with Bianca, an aging movie star notorious for her shock and awe tactics. Schooling Bianca on the fine art of behaving like a diplomat's wife is the greatest challenge of Margot's career. <laughs> uh, and it'll go on from there, I'm sure. This author has a really, uh, really good ear for controlled chaos plots. It, they are her specialty, so I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I, I doubt very much. Unlike Michael Wolf, I'm kind of expecting that it will infuriate me and leave me feeling soiled. Uh, Symphony in C, I'm kind of expecting the best. The author has an extensive career in... Well, actually, did I read you about the author? Uh, he's an executive director of, a director of the Deep Carbon Observatory based at Carnegie Institution's Geophysical Laboratory and Clarence Robinson Professor of Earth Science at George Mason University. And he lives... In Bethesda, Maryland. <laughs> and you can't go wrong there. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm hoping that Symphony in C will teach me and maybe delight me. I'm expecting that the Michael Wolf book will infuriate me and maybe feel, make me feel soiled. And I'm counting on Susan Mallory to, to just please the daylights out of me. So those are the three that I haven't read. And now we'll talk about the three that I have read. Uh, and they are all recommendations. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that for your Amazon wish lists and your TBRs, but nevertheless, the first one is science. Oh my, was this book good. And it's thin, too. It's it, Don't let the size fool you, because you it is so jam-packed with mind-expanding, thought-provoking stuff that you'll be a year digesting it all. This is by James Treffill and Michael Summers, and it's called Imagined Life. Uh, and this comes out... Uh, when does this come out? Uh, in late September. <laughs> but I couldn't wait, because it's a tiny little thing, so I just gobbled it down. And it's all about, uh, not only the origin of life on Earth, that gets a bit of space in here, but about what the variations are, what we might expect on all these exoplanets that we're finding out there in the universe. Uh, exoplanet after exoplanet, after, there are thousands of them by now, who that are, that are coming, that are bouncing back the right spectrography so that we are pretty certain that they are in what's referred to as the Goldilocks zone of the orbit around their star. Not too close so that it's too hot for water to form, not too far away so that it's too cold for water to form. In other words, the possibility of life, the possibility of organic life, uh, or at least an organic material. Uh, and this book oh, <laughs> covers everything, it covers absolutely everything about what we know about those exoplanets, about what we might know in the future using different techniques, and about what we can imagine life doing apart from the one and only example that we have, which is life on Earth. Is it possible, for instance, that complex uh, quasi-organic life could form without water? It seems like it kind of wants to do that in the atmosphere of Jupiter, for instance, which has almost no water. It's one of the driest places anywhere in the solar, in the solar system. 
if it can do that, maybe it can do more. <laughs> and also, what, what about the liquid forms of other of other substances, not just water? What about, you know, liquid methane or liquid ethane that, that, that exists in vast quantities in subterranean oceans and the moons of, Mar of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter? Could life form there? It might be slower life. It might be very strange life, but could it? And the authors also have a great little digression here. The book is full of great little digressions. That are all oh, there. Oh, they are whole science fiction series, ba just implied in those one, one and two page digressions. And one of them is that the authors point out that uh, Earth, once it cooled and once it was covered in water, was immensely uh, hospitable to life, but also regularly being bombarded by the the asteroids that we mention on this channel with depressing regularity. And that sometimes, from what we can determine, the intervals between killer asteroid strikes, in other words, the kind that sends up enough material into the atmosphere to darken the world for years, that boils, that brings the ocean to a boiling temperature, sometimes for as long as a thousand years, so that there's absolutely no possibility of organic chemistry that we, are, as we understand it. Uh, the authors point out that the gap between some of those killer strikes in Earth's, in Earth's ancient history was as long as a million years, maybe more than a million years. So, as they point out, who knows what was born and evolved during that time? A million years is a long time. <laughs> I just, if you are the type to just sit and dream, if you are the type to let a book just nag at your thoughts, just open your mind, and also, if you're a science fiction writer, then this is a must book. Oh, it was so good. I'm sure. I think I will probably be getting... I, I mean, does this... Yeah, this comes out as a hardcover. So I'll be getting another shot at this book. I will read it again. Easily. I will read it again. I'll take a lot more notes when I get the hardcover later on in the year. Uh, then this next one. This next one's biography. You're kind of thinking that you'd get through this <laughs> this whole thing without a biography. This is a biography. I don't know... I don't know exactly when this comes out. I wonder if... It, do I have a... Uh, a date on this? It's amazing how many pub sheets these days don't come with dates. The only thing that you really want to know. Okay, yeah, this comes out in just a bit. This is this is due in, in June, in early June. This is by Andrew Stoner, and it is the journalist of Castro Street. It's a biography of Randy Schultz, uh, who, I, I wonder if I can read, do I have anything here? I've got blurbs. Uh, burr, 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 burr. Well, Randy Schultz was a, he was a gay journalist. He was a groundbreaker. He talked to people who had never talked to journalists before. And he wrote a classic. He wrote And the Band Played On. And this is, as far as I know, the first fully researched, just broad-scale biography of him. And I loved it. I, I don't know why. I don't know why it's... Uh, I think it's being issued as just this. It's just a, a naked a trade paperback uh, by uh, the University of Illinois Press. I'm not sure why that is. I'm not sure why this is not a full dress hardcover with, you know, the whole lifespan of a book in front of it. But uh, Randy Schultz was there at Ground Zero. He was there He was there going down the mean streets and talking to people when almost everything about his own personal life and the lives of the people he interviewed was criminal and medicatable. It was a totally different world. And uh, the book just makes you realize afresh, all over again, how brave he was in his own way, how brave he was to do the work that he did. Uh, I, I thought it was fantastic. I, I really did. I, it was one of, the, one of the, my favorite biographies so far this year. Uh, and then this last one, the last thing of the three that I've read is something that we've seen on this channel. I, the last time you saw it on this channel, I was saying that I was just about to read it, and I did read it, and boy, oh boy, did I love it. I just loved it. It's a debut novel. It's by Jake Wolf, and it's a history, the history of living forever. Uh, I, you just ignore the, de the, the requisite ugly American cover. I could, who is this? FSG for Ostras and Giroux, uh, if you're listening, <laughs> my services for designing a cover that will not repulse people are free and they're available at any time for any book on your list. It's too late for this, but nevertheless. But, uh, oh boy, oh boy, what a book this is. It's a, it's, it starts out as, the, as a gay love story. An extremely precocious, brilliant high school student named Conrad, who's actually skipped a few grades, he's so smart, uh, falls for a new science teacher at his high school. Uh, and, and the feeling is very much mutual. And, and there, are some, there are some cold 
water wake up moments, they, they fall into a physical relationship almost immediately. Not immediately upon meeting, but immediately upon starting to actively flirt with each other. That becomes physical and a wonderful scene, a fantastic scene where it becomes physical. And yet there is always the specter of, I mean, I mean, as the character, as Conrad points out at one point in the book, you know, if it's, if it's an older man sleeping with a much younger girl, then everybody says, oh, you go, good for you. And if it's, and if it's other variations on that, then it might be a little bit cautionary or a little bit creepy or whatever. But if it's an older teacher who's male sleeping with a male younger student, then it's the end. Not only is it the end of both their lives, but it's a long prison sentence for the teacher. Uh, and yet it doesn't seem to matter that the, the, the flashbacks to their relationship are wonderful. And then uh, right away in the book, tragedy strikes right away. Uh, so it's not, it's not any time. I'm not giving anything away. You won't be, you won't be 10 pages in before you get to it. The teacher's found dead of an overdose. And this is incomprehensible. The scene where our main character, Conrad, finds out is perfectly done. The incomprehension is so thick that it takes him a long time to even understand the words that people are saying because he knows this guy and he didn't do drugs. So what on earth is going on here? And he grows up and he goes to therapy and he marries as a husband. And uh, it turns out that his, his high school science teacher lover was deeply involved in a, a seemingly crackpot search for biochemical immortality for the so-called fountain of youth. And if, if circumstances in, in Conrad's life later as an adult conspire to make him very interested in whether or not there's anything to that. But really, I mean, that is the plot. The plot is, is a search for the elixir of eternal life, or basically. I mean, it's it's dressed up in modern in modern talk and, uh, and and well done that way. It's not there's nothing about this. You know, I always I always uh, mock the made up stories on this channel because they're so absurd. This book embraces its absurdity. It knows that that its main you know plot is a bit on the silly side. The thing that won it for me is the sheer gusto of the language, just unabashedly romantic language, unabashedly. I don't want to use the word florid, because florid now is entirely negative in its connotations, but rapturous, just just, just total command. This, this author has total command of what he's doing on the page. It was just so refreshing. I, I mean, after so many, after so many novels that are just so thin and soupy and lost up in the author's own little egotism cult, to read something like this that very much wants to tell you a story a couple of stories and that is that doesn't take any sentence for granted that doesn't bank on any momentum on your part every line has been worked over it was just so refreshing to do so i think this comes out in june uh does this come out in june yeah this comes out in a little bit too this comes out right around the same time as, as symphony and c so <laughs> you can try it at your library i strongly recommend this anyway whether you get it at the library whether you're flush and you buy it at the bookstore or whatever I strongly recommend it. It was it was an absolute delight. Uh, and there you go. That is my Friday reads uh, for today. So we, we do a, a novel, not just a novel, but a debut novel. Can't wait to see what this author's career will be like. Hope he doesn't just write this book and then disappear. Uh, this is The History of Living Forever by Jake Wolf. Highly recommend it. Uh, then The Journalist of Castro Street, a, a, a thin life of Randy Schultz, who who made a big mark in the world. Uh, then Imagined Life, uh, which is coming out in September. That's, I think, the latest away from all of these things. I don't think... I think everything else is coming out right away. But I couldn't I couldn't resist Imagined Life. I couldn't resist diving in right away. And boy, am I glad I did, because it's terrific. Uh, and then uh, The Summer of Sunshine and Margot, which is kind of a Pygmalion riff, just as you can tell from that description. It's a kind of a Pygmalion, a kind of a, you know, My Fair Lady riff. But there's so much else going on, especially with the, uh, Susan Mallard is really good. She has, she always has a couple of linchpin main characters, but like so many other romance authors, she's really good with the supporting cast. You get a lot of, a very a well-imagined supporting cast in this book. Just, uh, I can't wait to see if this, I mean, I can't imagine that this will be the first bad Susan Mallory novel that I read. I can't imagine that. Uh, and then Symphony in C. This is a, a great big popular science book about carbon author says it's the most important thing that there is and has a, the most fascinating story 
I'm willing to hear that story, absolutely. <laughs> and then last and least, uh, this is Siege by Michael Wolf, the author of Fire and Fury. This is his new book, uh, Trump Under Fire, which opens with him saying that the Trump, the Trump is facing attacks on all sides uh, and that it's making him feel embattled and crazed. <sighs> I'm, I'm going to take this one for you, book two. <laughs> I, I don't advise you to read it. I will let you know what I think of it. <laughs> so there you go. That's Friday Reads. Uh, as usual, I'd like to know what you're reading, and you're going to get more bookish talk anyway. <laughs> it's, uh, I could do uh, you know a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday Reads. <laughs> but I want to hear what you're reading, and uh, keep in mind uh, that our reading converges this weekend, right? Because on Sunday, we're doing two read-alongs. The first six books of the Iliad, the first 20 chapters of The Prime Minister by Anthony Trollope. So, <laughs> you, want, you want to be doing your reading. Try not to read ahead for the Iliad. We'll concentrate on these six books. I, I don't want you to overstrain, because that's the first, the first step towards people saying, I can't do this. So, you know, just the beginning of the Iliad and, and the first 20 chapters of The Prime Minister. Uh, and I... <laughs> well, the Iliad, I don't know. Those of you who've never read it, those of you who've never read it before and you're reading it for the first time in an English language translation, there are a couple of books in those first six that are going to strain you. <laughs> They're going to strain your patience. Uh, so I don't know really what you'll be thinking at the end of book six. I know without any doubt at all what every single one of you will be thinking at the end of chapter 20 of The Prime Minister. And that will be, I'm not going to wait. I have to read more. <laughs> So feel free. You have my my papal dispensation to read ahead on the Prime Minister. I'm rereading it for probably the seventh time, and I couldn't resist <laughs> I, myself. I couldn't resist, and I was also underlining tons of things. And we can't do that. You can't underline every line. <laughs> so we have we'll we'll talk books tomorrow. Also, of course, all kinds of books tomorrow, and then Sunday. We'll be on the same page. <laughs> It'll be blissful. <laughs> or anyway, I'll wrap this up for now. But I'll see you soon. Thank you, book two.